shapeshifters hope that you enjoyed this rare and infamous moment that combines a first-rate disaster with genuine historical significance. But now it's time to take a deep breath and get those cameras out as we prepare to temporally reset you to one of the most fantastic catastrophes in history. Are you ready? Everyone, and welcome to a Time Shifters podcast. This is Christopher, and here, as always, with my good friend and co host, Tom. Tom, how are you? I'm good. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, no. yeah I need to put in some applause and stuff <laughs> there for you. you. Work on the sound effects, man. Anyway, <laughs> yeah, no. I, t- I tend to. Tend to try to not make the podcast into a morning sh- radio morning show. But... <laughs> hey, it's Wacky Chris with Crazy Tom. <laughs> but <laughs> maybe that should be the entire theme for next year. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't do it. That, I don't think I could keep it up. That would be fun to watch, though. <laughs> And before we get into a whole lot of other things, I just wanted to read something that uh, showed up on our Discord server. Oh, yeah. Friend of the show, fellow podcaster Steph from the uh, Film Gazers podcast. She just listened to our Demolition Man episode, and she says it's a fun episode. Demolition Man is one of my all-time favorites. Snipes and Stallone are just fantastic, and Bullock is adorable. It's one of those films from the era that, to me, perfectly balanced satire, comedy, action, and dystopian sci-fi themes in one fun package. I didn't see it until after Austin Powers came out. The scene they spoofed with the goo after waking up from cryogenic sleep, I had to be told what it was making fun of. So naturally, I watched the movie after, and I've continued to watch it ever since. (laughs) It's definitely a classic in my eyes. Like, very cool. You know what? And weirdly enough, I didn't make the connection with the Austin Powers and Demolition Man. <laughs> no, uh, I, that wasn't my first go-to for that either, so. But I think she's probably definitely onto something there, though. Yes. Uh, but thank you very much, Steph, for uh, for leaving that comment. I appreciate it, and thank you very much for listening. I'm glad you enjoyed the episode. Yes, thank you. Few things that have come up recently. This surprised me when a trailer for a third Venom film dropped. Yeah, I honestly wasn't aware they were making that one either. Yeah, I had no idea because the first two, wow, uh, I know they existed. I know I watched them. I definitely couldn't tell you anything that happened in the first one, and I can barely tell you anything that happened in the second one. Uh, there was a fight in a church. <laughs> yeah, I, and that was one because uh, uh, my son's a big fan of the the Venom and Carnage stuff, uh, and we watched it together. And, and it's one of those that I keep wondering. Oh, okay, apparently you can throw any weaponry at these symbiotes, and, and nothing happens. So why do they keep creating knife like things to throw at each other? And what happens to the person on the inside? Whoa. Well, the symbiote's being knifed. So, I don't know. I, it always struck me as the fights didn't seem quite right. Yeah, well, they're comic book fights. They and are. I'm a fan of the... I am a fan. I used to read the Venom uh, comic books. There, there was a short uh, Venom series, and he would show up in the Spider-Man. And, uh, yeah, there was the Carnage. I actually liked a, a lot that I, that I read. Mm-hmm. That stuff doesn't really seem to come through in these films no, for me. not really. They're not... Well, and since, for whatever reason, they haven't really fully tied them into Spider-Man, it's kind of lost its more. I mean, that's kind of where Venom gets his vibe from to begin with, is you have to do the black suit on Spider-Man in order to get to Venom and Eddie Brock. And right. So the fact that they just struck out with Eddie Brock as Venom and then all the stuff that happens later, like, uh, okay, you, uh, you, you, you did it, but you've completely untethered it from its source material. Right. Yeah. And you know, someone else, I, I think I, um, I saw the trailer somewhere or I don't remember if, but someone commented like Batgirl gets shelved in this film and this series gets three films. <laughs> <laughs> I think absolutely that is the the attitude we should all have. Yeah, well, 
it, it, we'd have to get into the whole Warner Brother debate and how they choose to treat their own properties. Yes, yeah. That, that's a whole other topic. Other news that came as a bit of a surprise. Mm-hmm. Uh, by now, everyone, uh, by now, the news, every all the news that we're talking is going to be you know several weeks uh, past sure. when it actually happened. But uh, Godzilla Minus One suddenly showed up on Netflix. It did. And it's dubbed. Yeah, that kind of surprised everybody because there is still, at a time of recording, no release date for her home video for a Blu-ray for this thing. I had no idea they were in contention to pick it up, and I, and then on top of it, it just literally showed up. <laughs> yeah, it just, boom, here it is. There was no everyone's... even, like, coming soon kind of thing. It's just, boom, it's on the server, let's go. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it kind of took everyone by surprise, uh, and but it's apparently doing really well. And the people that hadn't seen it in the theaters are now able to watch it, and they're they're commenting, going, "Oh my God, that was a really good film." Yes, <laughs> it's like yes, yes, it is. And, and actually, I'll give them a little credit for on Netflix putting it uh, putting the dubbed version on. Um, I intend to actually try to watch that one too, just because then it's then I don't have to read, uh, but. <laughs> But I want to get the vibe from that one, but it makes it instantly more um, um, accessible to to the American market. So, yeah, no, that's absolutely true. So it, it, it will do very well and probably continue. Can't wait for minus two. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, I'll be happy with the Blu-ray for minus one. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I finished Discovery. Did Star you? Trek Discovery. I, you know, I, I watched the final episode of that. Okay. <laughs> it's done. Yep. <laughs> and I, I, I never feel, I will never feel obliged to watch Discovery again. I still can't get out of last season. <laughs> yeah. It was fine. <laughs> you know, uh, it, it was, it was fine. It's, <laughs> it's definitely not a series that it really uh, connected with me. I know there are a lot of people, a lot of big Discovery fans, and sure. I, I they seem to have really enjoyed the series and, and enjoyed the finale, and that's fantastic. It's just, it never connected with me, and I watched because it was it was Trek. It looked sure. pretty. Uh, most of the cast was always just, the char- cast of characters I thought were pretty phenomenal, although a good portion of them weren't in most of the season, which kind of annoyed me a bit <laughs> it's like this is why i watch and you're they're not there but yeah but that's over with now um i kind of predicted most of what was going to happen yeah in the finale so i'll take half points <laughs> <laughs> the other series i've been watching is doctor who of course this season, I think, got off to a little shaky start for me. Yeah. The first two episodes I didn't think were terribly strong, but the last three at the time of recording have been really good. Wow. Um, it has uh, become a show that I look forward to watching or you know, from week to week, which I haven't been able to say in almost 20 years. I have to ask then, um, because... You know I, I have more of an ebb and flow when it comes to Doctor Who. Uh, it wasn't my mm-hmm. go-to thing. But I do enjoy good Doctor Who, and I suffer bad Doctor Who. Um, so I got out um, a couple of seasons ago because the storytelling fell apart and I just couldn't handle um, Absolutely. her like, wind-up and here's the pitch kind of uh, attitude toward the sonic screwdriver. <laughs> Yeah. Um, not not her fault, just that was not a strong showing of storytelling. Uh, so can I get in on this doctor without having to go back through all of that? Yes. Yes? Okay. Yes. I think you could jump into this doctor. As I said, um, the, the premiere, um, the church on Ruby Road is, is fine. Uh, it's a little, you you may cringe a little at one point. Well, uh, Doctor Who's next, always been good at that anyway. <laughs> yeah. Um, the next two episodes, I think you kind of have to, you in particular might have to just sort of slog through. Mm-hmm. 
but when you hit the third episode, which I think is uh, Boom, I think it's called. You're better with the titles. <laughs> yeah. Um, that's when it really like starts running, and I like that was a really good episode. Then I'm going to, uh, yeah, I'll have to get in on this doctor and give this a shot because I, I miss it. Mm -hmm. But because the way they go about even, God, the lengths of time between actual content is just so, it's kind of like Doctor, it, it, it's literally Doctor Who, question mark? <laughs> like, oh yeah, that's right, that was a thing. So, so yes, no, I'll, I'll, I'll take you up on that. I'll, dig, I'll start digging in. I think this season would be worth dipping your toes back in cool. and seeing what, what you think. Cool. Uh, I'll take that. All right. That's yeah, sweet. Outside of that, I haven't really been doing all that much else. That's been taking up my time. Well, and uh, as we discussed ahead of the recording, um, this past week I took vacation. So there are lots of projects around the house, including hopefully one that is supporting the show while I watch it fall apart. So <laughs> at any rate... But one thing I did take back up is there was a horror series out of MGM Plus called From. Um, I may have okay. discussed it on the show. Oh about yeah, a year that, ago. that's yeah, that's the uh, the town that people just show up. Yes. and they're from different times and places. Or they at least different places, and yes, they're different. They, they're all on the same timeline, so it's not like all of a sudden somebody from 1842 shows mm. up. It's not like that, but but yes, there have been people who have been trapped in the town for a really long time, and then like new people show up, and they're trapped too. So it, it picks up from there. So, and, and I think it's kind of funny. It has kind of a lost vibe to it in that respect, um, which is funny because the main character, the sheriff of the town, is from Lost. Right. <laughs> so, but so I watched. The entire second season, and as I understand it, the third is due out later this fall. So, and again, I am incredibly entrenched in this town that they've created. Um, it's even kind of fun in the second season because while we were introduced to what it was in the first season and the characters and the stuff that was going on, uh, the second season starts to become about well, what is this place? And, and what can we figure out? And is there a way out? Can we can we escape this thing? It would be easier to watch with a week in between each episode. Because this suffers from the... Because they're always in a panic mode. There's always something horrible going on. Literally the same lines that everybody says to each other every single time is... Are you Okay. Mm -hmm. The whole are you okay thing becomes almost a drinking game because you can probably get pretty toasty in just one episode at how many times people ask another person, are you okay? Uh, that aside, um, I am so into the mystery of this thing, but I don't know that the writers actually know. <laughs> oh. So... I keep seeing them introduce things and then take things away. And I'm like, do you not know where this is going? Like, have you not arced this thing? So, or have you not even created the backstory for where you're at? Like, do you not know what this is? Because the characters themselves, they explore, uh, well, is this, is, a is this essentially a, a stress laboratory? Are we being put here? and controlled by all these things that they do to see how we respond. And so a couple latch on to that, and, but I'm not giving anything away. It doesn't necessarily go anywhere, or if it's going to, they've at least let it die down for now. But then they introduce other kind of supernatural, paranormal things that start happening. And then they, they find a way to give it, take it down a notch, but in doing that, you didn't learn anything. You don't know what all this stuff is. And, and and since it's such a long form story, at some point you gotta give that. What that's the point, isn't it? <laughs> We're supposed to learn more about this. But yeah, and, and by the time we get to the season finale, which there are cliffhangers, and then there's dropping you off of the cliff. 
And this one dropped you off the cliff. Uh, like literally the last scene of the second season takes it somewhere, somewhere different that you're like, Okay, I can kind of see that you might have done that, but it's starting to feel a little like Jr. waking up from, <laughs> or or whoever woke up in the in Dallas. So, uh, yeah, it, it, it's a fun watch. It's got me entrenched, but I need something to happen, something more. No, I, I think I know exactly. I at least have an idea yeah. of how you feel when the the, the story is done. I've definitely watched some series that either I feel like. You didn't know where this story began, or you really don't know where it's going. Right. Yeah, and that, that's kind of where we're struggling, is we kind of don't know where it's going, and every element that it adds to it doesn't get us further. If anything, I'd say it takes us further away from what's happening. I don't think they knew exactly where they were going was another British series called The Fades, which had a real supernatural... Uh, angels demon kind of thing going yeah and the end of the series you're witnessing the beginning of what looks like the end of the world <laughs> i'm thinking do you have any that is is this all you planned <laughs> was this how you really intended on, on ending the show was that just going to be it is this a one and done and it's up to us to decide or were you thinking this was con- going to continue because there's a whole lot of story that you don't kind of finish up <laughs> Yeah, you hate those loose ends. Well, the, the, yeah. the, the other parallel that I can make with From, which it hasn't been on long enough to get you there yet, but like The Walking Dead, um, as long as that ran, as good as some of it was, the the sheer level of tension that just never let up starts to affect you emotionally as you're watching the thing too and it becomes like i i don't want to watch it because i don't want to feel that anymore yeah. and that's my fear for this show from they are on their constant terrible horrible pressure related to what is going on that i it, if you don't somehow build in a solve point or a way to at least alter the story that gives you a chance to go ah yeah. Yeah. <laughs> i'm not why are you crying stick it. it's a commercial <laughs> yeah yeah that that actually commercials that probably help in some cases <laughs> at least you got to take the break for a second okay yeah. i can breathe for the moment thanks right <laughs> We've been up to anything else, or is that, that about it? Oh, I'm sure there are others that I'm forgetting, but yes, because I made last week about work, too, at home. <laughs> uh, I, I, I have this hard time. I love my, my downtime. I love to wa- watch the new and different things that I haven't gotten to, and then I feel guilty for having done any of it, and then I make myself overly busy with other things. <laughs> Understood. All right, well, with that, we'll take a break. We'll listen to a promo for another podcast. And then when we get back, we jump to 1981 to look at the romantic comedy Heartbeeps. Welcome to Film Gazers, a podcast focusing on the science fiction, horror, fantasy, trinity, and 20th century entertainment. I'm Steph. I'm Jess. We're cousins slash besties. Join us as we reminisce, discuss, and review films from our childhood. Follow on Instagram at Film Gazers and listen to the show wherever you like to get your podcasts. Later, taters! And now, direct from his worldwide tour, we proudly present the one and only Leonard Catskill. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Good evening, ladies and germs. It's great to be here. Of course, at my age, it's great to be anywhere. But seriously, folks, I'm here to tell you about this new movie. It's called Hot Beeps, and it's about me and my pals. Here's Val Count. Turn your head around. I don't want to say he's dim-witted. But he makes an electric toothbrush look like a genius. Look the fire. My function? To serve as companion and valet. 
being programmed for charm was probably an extra expense. This is Aquacom. She was popular mechanics playmate of the month for June 1994. Did a load of those components. Wowie wow. <gasps> And then there's Philco. He's a great kid. But he had no sense of humor until he met me. I haven't been this happy since the time I bought a pet skunk. My wife said, where do you expect to keep it? I said, under our bed. She said, what about the smell? And I said, he'll have to get used to it just like I did. Now the problem is, we're all being chased by this overgrown squad car named Crime Buster. Don't get excited. Don't get excited. Remain stationary for computer check. While waiting, you may enjoy a brief musical interlude. He's a cross between Darth Vader and a Sherman tank. I've heard of party crashes, but this is ridiculous. But believe me, folks, this movie's got a lot going for it. There's action, adventure, romance, raccoons, even people. Hey, kid. Behave yourself. <laughs> oh, yeah. And I'm in the movie, too. <laughs> But seriously, folks, don't forget to see Universal's new movie, Heartbeat. And it's coming for you know when. And speaking of Christmas... Andy Kaufman, Bernadette Peters, in Heartbeat, coming this Christmas. It's holiday entertainment for everyone. So I says, I don't care who you are, Fatso. Get those reindeer off my roof. Beeps stars Andy Kaufman, Bernadette Peters, and Randy Quaid. It is about two humanoid robots, while in the factory for repairs, strike up a relationship and decide to head out on their own to explore the world. Valcom 17485 and Aquacom 89045, along with a comedian bot Catskill 55602, managed to leave the factory and began wandering the nearby forest. Along the way, when they stop in a nearby town to acquire some parts, some spare parts, but realizing they won't be able to carry them all, they construct a small helper, which they name Philco. Another robot, a Crime Buster Deluxe model, who was also in for repairs, begins to hunt the strange mechanical family down, determined to bring them in complete or in parts. Also on their tail is the two factory warehouse workers responsible for them. It isn't long before the bots find navigating the strange outside world difficult, but the adversity brings them all closer, and Val and Aqua discover their pleasure sensors are becoming more erratic in each other's presence. Andy Kaufman wanted to make a film uh, starring his alter ego, Tony Clifton, a crass Las Vegas lounge singer, but Universal Studios was unsure of Kaufman's ability to carry a film as a star since he had only appeared on, tele <clears throat> on television or in small minor roles. They gave him the part in Heartbeeps as a test. When the film crashed at the box office, any plans for the Tony Clifton film was scrapped. The role of Aquacom was originally offered to Sigourney Weaver. Oh, really? She was actually very interested in working with Kaufman, but at the behest of her agent, she eventually turned down the part. Stan Winston did the makeup effects for this film, and he was actually nominated for an Academy Award for it, but lost out to Rick Baker for his work on American Werewolf in London. And I think that was probably appropriate. Yes, I, I uh, agree a thousand percent. <laughs> I, I think actually the makeup is really creative and really good in this. Stan Winston did an amazing job, oh, yeah. but... I don't think you can argue that American Werewolf in London is the superior <laughs> of the two. No, everything they went through just on the transformation sequence alone. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Nah, that's all you can do with that one. Absolutely. A little bit of trivia that the here that I have is the Crime Buster, mm -hmm. if he looked at all familiar, he was a redress of the Death Probe from the fourth season Six Million Dollar Man episode. Ah, I thought that looked familiar. <laughs> yes, it's very cool. That's actually an episode I'd love to get a hold of the Six Million Dollar Man. That's one episode I'd actually like to watch again. Yeah, that'd be fun. <laughs> we both went into this film with a fair amount of trepidation. I think that came through our, when we announced it in our last episode. Oh, yeah. Uh, mainly because... We knew nothing about the film no, because it I just hadn't heard of it. Yeah, you hadn't heard about it. I sort of knew about it, 
kind of only on the peripheral. Uh, and then what you kind of read about it is not great. And we'll get into that later. <laughs> Absolutely. My wife and I sat down and watched this thing, and we were pretty much expecting the worst. It isn't terrible. It's not a great film by any stretch no. of the imagination. It is not a uh, sort of a hidden gem. There you go. It's it, it is not a, it is not any of that, but it is not intolerable. <laughs> I thought it was actually it was a little cute. It was kind of just a, sort of a, just a a mindless romp. I, I I'm probably going to floor you here. I kind of liked it. <laughs> I, yeah, that's what I'm. That's I mean, kind of what I'm getting to. It, and, and you said the word I, "cute." It, 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 it's adorable. It's, <laughs> yes, it, it, it's a teddy bear of film. <laughs> it just, it's just this warm, cuddly thing, and, and you're just like, this thing is garbage but i can't help but love it a little <laughs> it almost feels like this could easily be sort of um this could show up on like on disney's world of imagination or something <laughs> <You know? laughs> it's like a little family it's a great little family film and, and this one predates it but honestly i got lots of um short circuit vibes from from, from this like Instead of going with the more um, a action-oriented and, and single robot, what if we made a family one? And mm -hmm. like, and it did. It had that feel, the that that innocence of it. Yeah, it wasn't like oh, he was struck by lightning and it altered his programming. It was just for just a quirk of fate that these two bots sort of connected and kind of developed their their own little uh, self-consciousness no i yeah I, well, I, most of it was even uh, uh written off earlier in the film as to they, they've been malfunctioning yes so but in this case life was the malfunction yeah this is the kind of stuff that in a more serious tone has been explored in things like star trek and and other films and, and television shows that are taken seriously and and regarded as oh no that really good episode like oh what about heart beeps then <laughs> no uh, uh, no exactly because actually while i was also may while i was making the short circuit comparison in my head while i was watching this i was also making the ai comparison the movie ai i saw lots of stuff that ended up in ai in this film and like like this is the cute, squishy, soft, very innocent version, and then AI ratcheted it up to a different level. But it was there. I'm like, wow. yeah, yeah. There is really no difference in the evolution of these of these creatures mm -mm. that that brings that brings them to to um, to having emotions and and connections to each other. There's no difference between this and what goes on with the character in AI. No, not not at all, and that's that's the thing that was just it, it, it just enamored me more because I'm like this one came before you others, so I'm like while this one's not fantastic and yeah, I'm sure it stunk up the place in the theater, <laughs> just like but you other properties took stuff from this, whether you even knew it or not. <laughs> yeah. No, it was definitely some very um, recognizable themes, mm -hmm. certainly. Not that that's hard to do, anyway. Yeah, I was just looking to see what else came out in December of 1981 that this might have gone on against. Universal Pictures themselves had On Golden Pond in the theaters. That's a... That's kind of a big one. There was a Cinderella re-release from Walt Disney... Chariots of Fire was sweeping the box office in 1981. We also had Taps coming out in December of that year. And I believe Modern Problems also did pretty well in the theater. Yeah, this thing didn't have a ghost of a chance. <laughs> I think it was the right time because it is a family film. Yeah. It was definitely something to you, you take the kids to while you're on your holiday break, the family too. Uh, but 
compared to everything else that was in the theater, no, it wasn't going to happen. No. Because I do, I did end up liking this thing. But it is an odd combination uh, with Andy Kaufman and Bernadette Peters. Not not what you call likely couple. You no, know, no, that is true. I mean, Andy Kaufman, I know him from some of his sort of the stand up, his uh, you know, uh, Mighty Mouse routine, and of course his his role as a as Latka on Taxi. Yeah, and, and I was that was the thing because he kind of chose the Latka voice to do for the character in Heart Peeps. Yeah, a little bit. It was definitely felt a, a, a lot of. It was Latka very high pitchy, there. the the very mm-hmm. squeakier version, the Latka style. Right, just without so much of an accent. Yep. Oh yeah, no, definitely drop that part. <laughs> yes. Uh, I read uh, there was a uh, quote from Stan Winston somewhere in the trivia that he said that he learned one of his most valuable lessons while working on this film. He was a uh, working with the makeup with Bernadette Peters yeah. and there was, I think there was a lot of stress and there was a lot of crunch and he was trying to get things right and this and that and everything. And Bernadette Peters just looked at him and goes, this is, it's just a movie. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, Stan, and Stan Winston says, I've taken that advice through my entire career that in the end, you know what? I'm not saving the world. I am not curing cancer. <laughs> So sometimes you have to dial it back a little. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I just, I, I, I love that. Knowing that, hearing that, though, you just kind of got to wonder, she kind of know the way this was going to go? <laughs> I, yeah. She I, had to know the script uh, and the players and all that and gone, it's a gig. I'm going to get paid. <laughs> yeah, I, she was probably, I would think, the biggest name in the film. Andy Coffin was popular at the time. This was kind of the height of his career. But Bernadette Peters, I would think she would be like at the top of her game at this point. Yeah, so I mean, you don't know necessarily the motivation uh, for being in this. Yeah, she could easily have turned this down and went, you know, I'll just I'll go do something else on Broadway. <laughs> kind of, <laughs> <'Cause>, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, she always always had options. So, uh, and I think sometimes that is fascinating. Not that we're going to know it for this, but uh, but yeah, that whole what motivate once you achieved a certain level of stardom and you can work on anything, then then what is your path to some of the things that you end up in? Because amazing actors show up in all sorts of crap all the time, and. Mm-hmm. I think it's more, it's kind of interesting to find out. How did you end up in that? Like, uh, the, the one that's most popular for me is the fact that Leonard Nimoy ended up voicing uh, Sentinel Prime in one of those horrible Transformers movies. And he has a relation to, to Michael Bay, and that's why. Mm. Oh, <laughs> so, yeah. so could have done anything, went and did that. <laughs> I think my favorite um, my favorite quote along those lines was uh, from Michael Caine, who said in an interview about Jaws four <laughs> that he says I've never seen it, by but by all accounts it's terrible. Hell, however, I have seen the house that it built and it's terrific. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you get you gotta love the honesty. <laughs> <laughs> well, you gotta think these are actors. They're jobbing actors. They are that. that sure. It's what they do. This is their. The, they they get paid by at, to to act. And if the film is a bomb, they know it. But they're getting the paycheck for it. You know, if they have the option, great. They guess they you know they can turn it down. If not, it's like, eh, whatever. You always hear a lot of stories about people who, uh, and I don't think it's in the in this case because they filmed probably just outside of California or maybe in you know Colorado somewhere, if not just in studio. But there are a lot of actors who take gigs because it's gonna they're gonna film in Greece, right? <laughs> or they're gonna film in in Spain, and they're like, I've always wanted to go. Yeah, there. <laughs> I get a paid trip to somewhere I want to go. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, I get to work. I have to work for three four days, and then I. I get to hang out in the Mediterranean. I'll I'll do it. <laughs> yeah, no, I that that's what's fascinating. Once you're in that spot, that's sometimes the thing. 
I had to get, I got to get paid. Um, we were going to the right place. What, whatever the deal is, it's fun to hear why that somebody gets up in this position. And I think there was a little bit like Sigourney Weaver wanted to work with sure. Kaufman because he was a very interesting character at the time. Mm-hmm. Uh, Bernadette Peters may have felt the very same thing. You know, uh, she was a, an actress, but she was also, she also did a lot of comedy. She worked with Mel Brooks a lot. So maybe she was the same thing. Maybe she was like, well, I get to, I get to meet and work with Andy Kaufman, you know, cool. And there may be, maybe there was something in the script that, you know, caught her attention. Like we were just saying that there is some really great themes in this script where I could see an actor going, well, that's actually really interesting. Yeah, not, not, not to spoof on the title, but the, the movie does have a lot of heart. It does. It might be a little all over the place, but <laughs> it does have it. I was actually surprised how much fun I had watching the film. Yeah, I'll admit, uh, as soon as I ha- had to dial it up, I, I'm like, oh, this is, this is going to be a slog, isn't it? And I was just, I was tickled through the entire thing. It was just, I like this. This is fun. <laughs> it, it was. It was fun. It was cute. I think you said that yes, earlier. Yes, you said it uh, as well. Yeah, it's just, it's an adorable little film. <laughs> Uh, Val and Aqua, when they first meet, they're just kind of staying on the platform and they, they talk a little bit and then you see them kind of do that little glance over and then glance back. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but in, in a very robotic fashion. Uh-huh. <laughs> it's just, it's like uh, the storm comes and they kind of scoot over and their hands touch. And you're like, aww. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, no, everything about... Any time they were doing it, and of course, it's all just very, it's like childlike play with what it's to be an adult. Um, and, and that's kind of what it had. It was like, this was if you were a kid playing at family, um, and that's how it felt. And it was it was warm. It was comfortable. I love that they, um, they create this family, literally create literally. this family together. <laughs> yeah. They, they they create Phil. Uh, I think the, his full name is Phil Philco, Co. which which I thought was very cute. Yeah, but they call him Phil. But they create him for the very logical, you know, reason that well we need something to carry all our stuff with. Yep. And then they just naturally start treating him like a child, not because there's necessarily any emotional attachment, but because it just sort of makes sense that hey. No, you can't go wandering off. It's dangerous. Mm-hmm. <laughs> they sound just like adults, even though they, they're they approaching this all very logically. <laughs> Which I think there's uh, there's a lot of cleverness in that. Um, mm-hmm. But uh, I'm even going to dial it to just before they had to do that. The, the cute play uh, on his driving and her nagging <laughs> done as robots yes. and, and again with the logical element <laughs> to to it uh, that was just I, I, I get that this is this is some really cheesy writing but it just works it's funny I everything that I laughed at openly during the film was all stuff that I know how ridiculous it is, but because the way they did it, it worked. It it just was so sweet. It was kind of cool. Yes, yes. Would you would you please decrease your speed? My <laughs> fear sensor is being very active. <laughs> My safety. No, I have now become a competent driver. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and when she makes the request a second time, and she actually puts it that way. <laughs> <laughs> And I am, <laughs> I am declining your request. <laughs> Ooh, I wonder if it fits between those two trees. <laughs> ah. it, yeah, like I said, ridiculous, but it's so fun. <laughs> Let's mention, uh, we, we barely touched on it. Let's talk about uh, Catskill, who turns into the sort of the... Uh, the friendly uncle in this family. Yes. He was amazing. Uh, and in a weird way, they downplayed one of the best things about him. So 
I'll mention from um, an interview the uh, when we get to the cred- uh, to the critics. Uh, uh, Roger Ebert mentions that he noted at the end of the credits they mention that the jokes were credited to Henny Youngman, which is definitely the vibe of Catskill anyway. Um, but we get to a very very poignant scene, and they kind of just they didn't give it the grandeur I think it kind of needed, which is he's got to give his power source to Filco to keep Filco going, knowing that he'll deactivate. But in order to save the power to do that, they actually make a note that he had dialed down so far as to make them the worst jokes that he could yeah. he could tell. And, he was and, only telling the low-level jokes. Yeah, yes. he was telling the low-level <laughs> jokes, which, which is hysterical. And it, it fits, but I'm like, it's also incredibly touching. He made himself awful on purpose to to save the family that he has just adopted here. And, and I thought that was so cool. I think it was brilliant that they were able to turn him into a, a character you kind of feel for, even though he does nothing but speak in bad puns and jokes. <laughs> yes. He never talks directly. He never answers directly. No, in fact, that they have to have Aqua kind of give you the primer for that. He is. He's respond. They ask him questions, and he responds in a joke that doesn't sound like it does until Aqua latches on to. Uh, oh, he is. The joke had this element in it, so this is what he means. And she actually had to spell it out. <laughs> That's probably that's where some of the this is still not a good film <laughs> comes in. They managed to really show Catskill and Phil bond mm-hmm. with bad jokes and robot laughter, <laughs> which <laughs> and, and it, it it sucks you in. <laughs> oh, it, it it not only sucks you in, but then it really does kind of tug at you at the right time because. He dies on a joke, and Philco doesn't understand what's happened, but likes the joke. So Philco's laughing, and and you're watching, even when the laughter just starts to peter away, you're watching essentially a a, a young child learning what death is for the first time. Granted, they've done it in this super flowy, fluffy kind of environment, but if you read the uh, the underpinnings there, you're like, oh, this is actually really sad. <laughs> oh, very, very. I mean, this isn't a film that's going to bring you to tears, no. but it is, it is like a, oh. Yes. No, <laughs> this is where the harp music comes in on the sitcom. <laughs> yes. A very special episode of yes. Heart Beeps. <laughs> But yeah, no, so Catskill was way more fun because uh, when you even are introduced to him, you're like, oh, this is this is going to be what Rodney Dangerfield's character was supposed to be like in, in um, Caddyshack. Just constantly, <laughs> irritatingly. He's funny, but he's funny in a way where, you know, if this was real life, you would be irritated to no end by this character and I thought that's what we were walking into that this is going to be that character that's just going to drone in the background you're going to go please go away please go away please go away <laughs> and he wasn't he he, he he had he had a lot of heart beeps too <laughs> <laughs> I mean you nailed it there's just a lot of heart in this film yeah and it's a shame that I don't think it was appreciated for what it was um and, and the fact that we didn't actually catch this one, like this screamed Saturday matinee on, on Fox 19 back in the day. Well, back before it was Fox, when it was WXIX. But yes, our local UF, UHF station, this would have been perfect fodder for that. And I don't remember it ever having been aired. No, I don't. Re- I don't recall it either. In fact, if anything, that was one of the things I kept feeling about it while I was watching it. It has a made-for-TV feel to it. Yes, it, it it's almost feels like that it came out of an episode of something. To be honest, or that it could have been episodic. 
but it would have been cheesy sitcom episodic, and that might have worked too. But uh, yeah, I've seen you, worse. <laughs> you could have easily, and it even felt watching the film. You're like, and this is where the commercial break would go. It, yeah, it had those <laughs> moments as well. So yeah, no, I so it it was just a warm hug from the '80s. Yeah, I'm not going to say that this is like an unappreciated classic. No. But I, I do think it's very unfortunate that it is not regarded more highly than it is. I actually kind of wonder if if you were our age then and didn't like it, assuming you ever saw it to begin with, it might feel different now. <laughs> so That's a good point is... If you're watching it as a child, I think this would bore the hell out of you. Yes, absolutely. I can uh, totally see that because it, 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 as cute as it is, it's not It's not that. It's not an attention holder for a child. I saw there was something, and you know, take this with the grain of salt or whatever because it's read online, that Universal actually put a lot into the budget just based on the fact that uh, kids like robots because of... <laughs> C-3PO and R2-D2 and all that stuff. Yeah, and there were comparisons made about that amongst the critics. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we'll get to that at, uh, uh, soon enough, I'm sure. Yep. So, yeah, I would think <clears throat> I could see them trying to market this to kids and then kids not being interested because this is mushy stuff. <laughs> yeah, and, and it really is about becoming a parent, about... It's an about an adult relationship to boiled it down to its most innocent form. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's, I, I think you have to be in that mindset to appreciate it. And, and here, I'm just going to throw this out here. Uh, we're watching this now and as wholesome as this thing is, and it is straight up squeaky clean. It is just good. This is family channel, family fun kind of stuff. So... And with the intensity of the stuff that comes out these days, the the, the need for dark and gritty and, and uber realistic and, and all that, this felt like a palate cleanser to all of that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it just sits yeah, in It a, really did. Yeah, it just sits in a... It's like, here, let me wipe away some of that grime for a moment. Yeah, yeah. This With all the grime and everything, this is sort of warm and fuzzy. Mm-hmm. <laughs> And that's what it is, and it just it it sat right, and it doesn't help that uh, the the screener that we recently watched, the more was what I watched just before I watched this. <laughs> so you really needed a heartbeat. Yeah, I really kind of <laughs> did. I, I can get a warm hug after all that intense horror. <laughs> <laughs> it was uh, done in eighty one. It was. Set, I think, in 1995, I think I remember. Yeah. And I, that must have been just picked up. It must have been in a uh, print in a newspaper, a date picked up in a newspaper by somebody or something. Yeah, I heard it was supposed to be late century. <laughs> yes. Uh, but this does kind of have a little bit of predictions and everything. Uh-huh. Um, it probably had already started, but it's become a much more prevalent is the uh, warehouse automation. Yeah. Uh, the sort of self-driving forklifts and, and, and you know, uh, conveyances and things like that. Well, yeah, like particularly the uh, computer that drove up right next to them while they were going to store something in the warehouse. There are, th- while not quite like that, there are things that are exactly, th- they do that kind of thing. <laughs> yeah, you could actually see all this stuff and imagine it in an Amazon warehouse, your fulfillment state, you know, center or something. Oh yeah, and, that, and they legitimately have bots that go pick stuff. Yeah, just like the one driving around dumping robots off in random locations. <laughs> <laughs> and while I won't say that there was a whole lot more technology-wise, I do feel, and you kind of touched on a little bit that there's so many things that came later that seems very familiar when you watch this film. I was looking at Philco and I'm thinking Wally, (laughs) the way he sounds, the way he moves. Easily pulled Wally from Philco. Uh, Supposedly those beeps and whistles came from Jerry Garcia. Ah! (laughs) (laughs) That's awesome. I did not pick that up. (laughs) 
I'm sure it has no connection whatsoever, but the uh, Crime Buster Deluxe at one point pretty much gives everybody, you have five seconds to comply. <laughs> and I thought, oh my God, it's RoboCop. <laughs> Yeah, what, what, what's that one? I always forget the acronym. The Ed, the Ed 209, The Ed I think 209, yeah, he was rocking an Ed 209 vibe. <laughs> yeah, uh, very much. Uh, so I I got a kick out of that, that where well, there wasn't really any tech, all that much technology or anything. I still feel like there's some films that may be lifted from this, whether they meant to or not. <laughs> No, I absolutely. Like, like I said, the, well, all of the themes get run across all sorts of films, but yeah, there was stuff that you can almost pull straight. Like, be really hard pressed if Short Circuit didn't pull some from this. <laughs> yeah, cause, well, Short Circuit, I guess, wasn't too much later. That was mid eighties, wasn't yeah, it? It was mid eighties. So they absolutely that is feasible that they could have seen heart beeps fail and go okay what can we can, what can we do <laughs> to play off this and do a little better yeah and it was it was five years later it was nineteen eighty six yeah and the answer was Ali Sheedy <laughs> <laughs> not Steve Gutberg <laughs> depends on who you are I think. <laughs> We did get some uh, brief comments uh, when I posted the social media. We just got a we got a few comments on the Facebook. I said that it's coming soon. We're going to watch the eighty one comedy Heartbeeps, uh, and I said, "Why you ask? Well, why not?" <laughs> <laughs> Again, because I had no idea. I hadn't watched it yet. I didn't know what we were going to really be getting ourselves into. Billy Flynn comes in with, "I admire you testing your fortitude." <laughs> Chris Cree says, she says, I heard it's not good, but I have also been strangely attracted to it since it came out. So I, I think she's seen the posters and knows about it, but hasn't brought herself to watch it. Do it. Do it. Cameron says it could be worse. You could be watching that infamous Joe Pantilano kids robot movie Cheapy, <laughs> which I had to ask him to uh, expound on because I have no idea what he was talking yeah. about. Apparently he was talking about a film called Robot in the Family. Hmm. Okay. <laughs> Not familiar with that one at all. Uh, Derek M. Cook says, I saw this when it first hit the theater and repeatedly when it played on whatever premium channel we had at the time. As a kid, I loved it, but I haven't watched it in at least 30 years. That's interesting. As a kid, he really enjoyed it. Wow, okay. So we Maybe we're Maybe we're, Maybe off we're on mistaken that. on that. Well, now I kind of want to rewatch it <laughs> and, and, and tell us how you feel. Yes, I'll, to everyone that that has commented so far, I would recommend going and rewatching this film. Uh, Ruby Gallinati says, "Oh hell, I forgot about this one." <laughs> <laughs> You're not alone. <laughs> and Pete Quint says, oof, good luck surviving that one. Well, I can honestly say no problem surviving this one at all. No. I liked it. <laughs> yes. That's what we're struggling with. We know it's not good. We do. We know that it's not a great film. It just feels so good. It's fun. I, I can foresee myself watching this film again. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Easily. Yeah. It doesn't overstay its welcome. It's, what, an hour 20, I yeah. think? I mean... 88 minutes. Yeah. And it it's it's in and it's out. <laughs> <laughs> Which is right up your alley when it comes to your films. <laughs> yeah. I've, I've said on many occasions that you know, once you pass that 90-minute mark, I start getting a little... Mm, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Well, see, nicely under it. <laughs> oh, there was one little bit of trivia I wanted to bring up. I forgot talking about some of the cast. We talked about uh, Andy Coffin, Bernadette Peters. Oh, we did mention that Randy Quaid was in it. Yeah, yes. before Randy Quaid goes weird. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he's one of the uh, warehouse workers. Uh, you have to track him down. Um, a favorite of mine, if a character actor, a favorite of mine, Dick Miller, appears as a factory watchman. Yeah. Always great to see him show up, and even for a few minutes. Um, I mentioned Jerry Garcia. Crime Buster's voice, did it sound familiar to you? It did, but 
even when I looked it up, I wasn't sure. I didn't look up who I looked up. So, all right, tell me more. His the the actor or the voice actor is Ron Gans. Yes. And where you probably know him best, perhaps, he was the voice of Armus in Star Trek: The Next Generation. He was the the ah! tar creature that kills Tasha. Wow. Okay. <laughs> I, I, I hear it now, but <laughs> but wow, that that's an obscure connection. <laughs> it it was. Uh, it just it was one of those things where I just kind of scrolled down and I just kind of hovered over his name on the wiki and I went, oh, that's where I knew him from. <laughs> no, that's awesome. It now makes him even makes the uh, crime buster that much more creepy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. everyone who maybe have thought they knew about this film who watched this film in the past and 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 hated it or have never just heard things bad about it even andy coffin himself thought this film was terrible he went on he went on to letterman and apologized for it and said he, he he wants to give everybody back their money, to which Letterman responded, well, I hope you brought change for a 20. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, actually, that's funny, because that, that was the ending part for, for my critique section. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry to steal your thunder. Stepped all over it, man. <laughs> Yeah, I oh I yeah I completely I got so excited in this and excited that you enjoyed it and everything I completely kind of skipped the whole uh, part. <laughs> what did the critics think of this thing? Well, we, it was hard to find, and Andy Kaufman was probably the best critic of the film. <laughs> uh, but I, I did manage to dig up an actual Siskel and Ebert film uh, or 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 episode. Across the aisle from me, Gene Sisko, film critic of the Chicago Tribune. And this is Roger Ebert, film critic of the Chicago Sun-Times. Now, in addition to taps, Roger and I will be reviewing Taxi Zoom Klo, a controversial West German film about a homosexual school teacher. Also, a look at the Walt Disney animated film Cinderella, which has absolutely nothing in common with Taxi Zoom <laughs> Klo, except that it's playing in theaters this week. And later on, we'll also take a look at some of the films we can recommend for the holiday season. But first, Roger begins with a comedy about robots called Heartbeats. Well, Heartbeeps tells a dreary, boring, whimsical love story about two robots in the last years of the 20th century. They meet at the robot factory in its love at first transistor interchange. Mm -hmm. They wander away together, arm in arm, and along the way, they're joined by a cigar-smoking comedian robot who's named Catskill and tells jokes by Henny Youngman. Well, I couldn't believe it until I read the credits, and they said, Catskill's jokes mm -hmm. by Henny Youngman. You'll <laughs> believe it when you hear the jokes. The robotic lovers soon discover they're being pursued by a mechanical <laughs> cop and by human technicians, who want to return them to the robot factory. And in this scene, the robot couple, played by Andy Kaufman and Bernadette Peters, look for shelter in the cruel world away from their home factory. We could damage ourselves if we travel in darkness. The hollow part of the hillside would be a good place for shelter. Question, what are the probabilities of encountering hostile life? I have insufficient data. Whoa. Oh, dear. For a proper computation. Do you see an alternative shelter? Negative. Logically, the wild land could coexist with our units in the cave. Perhaps there's a way to make the animal mentally aware that we are not a threat. Wait, you could be basing your decision to act on invalid assumptions. We need shelter for the night, and I think that I am best equipped to attempt to provide it. Oh. Hello? Hi. I am taking a calculated risk. So perhaps you can tell by my lack of weapons and my non-threatening tone that we mean you no harm. What an exit. 
it's hard for us to recognize Andy Kaufman and Bernadette Peters underneath all that makeup. It's also hard for them to push out a performance that means anything in this movie. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, though, the makeup and the special effects are the only real stars in this dreary movie, creating a world that's sort of a cross between Star Wars and The Wizard of Oz. Before long, Kaufman and Peters feel an urge toward familyhood, and so they build themselves a little child robot named Phil. And in this scene, Kaufman explains the facts of life to Phil. For robots, the biggest fact of life is that your battery pack can run down. Phil, it will be night soon. Whoa. Whoa. What's the matter? <laughs> the absence of bright lights is not necessarily a problem in accomplishing tasks. For example, at night, remember those tiny lights in the sky? Mm -hmm. Those are stars. <laughs> One of them the North Star will appear soon, over there. Mm -hmm. The wonderful place of junk is in that direction, <gasps> north. That's where our friends are. Do you understand? Mm -hmm. Good. I don't think you'll be needing this anymore. So much information I want you to have. So many new parts that I do not possess. You know, you're the first robot I ever built and programmed. And I want you to know that in spite of problems, you have been performing very well. You are extremely efficient. <laughs> you aren't concerned about the coming absence of light now, are you? Good. Okay. Come on. It's about as thrilling as a cold potato pancake. That little <laughs> robot will remind some people of R2-D2 and Star Wars and his joke-telling robot pal Catskill. That guy has some of the same comic detachments that C-3PO had in the same movie. In fact, the whole movie, Heartbeep, seemed borrowed from other movies, not only from Star Wars for its robots and The Wizard of Oz for its relationship among the travelers, but even from such an unexpected source as Jean-Luc Godard's famous French movie, Weekend, which is also a fantasy in which innocent characters wander through a threatening, futuristic forest populated with storybook characters and hostile authorities. The only inspiration in Heartbeep was the idea to recycle all those old movie formulas through a story about robots. But the robots and their story are slow and halting and boring. The movie suffers from terminal cuteness. I think it's a bad film. I'm just uh -huh. thinking about what it would be like to hear your film compared to a cold potato pancake. <laughs> and then the other thing, of course, people will say, hey, it's John Luke Goddard, not John Locke. At any rate, that was, a, that was a philosopher. You know that. Excuse me. Okay. Well, at any rate, I think it's a terrible film uh -huh. uh, because the movie is 88 minutes. I checked this. Uh -huh. Before the titles begin, there's a three-minute sequence in which the two characters... Bernadette Peters and Andy Kaufman, mm -hmm. have a touching scene in front of a rainbow, and they have a human emotion. That these machines respond to that, okay? That's the whole movie. The other 85 minutes that follow after the title add nothing to I, the This film. sounds to me like the kind of the movie that was dreamed up over the wrong lunch. You yeah. know, maybe they ordered the wrong wine or something. The inspiration for this film is totally off-base. And furthermore, they didn't come up with any idea for what to do with it once exactly. they had the inspiration. Let's put these robots in the story. Fine. Now, how can we make the robots? How can we produce the film? Not Nothing. What, who are the robots and what is their story? Nothing there is no the story. story. There right. is no story. You march them out in the woods, you bring them back. It's yeah. terrible. He, he did point out one thing that I almost can't argue with, and that was the note that the entire movie actually takes place before the credits. Um, it, it, it's the scene that you're ta you've talked about where... He's put up in the warehouse, and they experience their night. Believe it or not, all of that happens before the opening title comes up. He said, if you had ended it right there, I'd have said, fantastic, you, you nailed it. But Great short film. But, yeah. but uh, otherwise, he said, everything after that was completely pointless. <laughs> <laughs> I disagree that everything was completely pointless because that's where all the cute comes from. But I do get, give him that that everything is fairly well contained in that first like eight minutes. Yeah, I hadn't thought of that before. But yeah, you could have easily done that. I could see someone doing that as just a short film. Yes. And it being like loved by by fans of you know short film and, and sci-fi and all that sort of stuff everywhere. Yeah, no, I... I, I it would have been very cool to see it in that way, but I still like this. 
Yeah. Uh, the only other critic I got, again, other than Andy Kaufman, uh, <laughs> was uh, from New York Times, Vincent Canby. He says, Heartbeats is a three-minute television sketch stretched to last nearly 90 unbearable minutes and fitted out with enough futuristic hardware to stock a short trailer for a science fiction film, he said. Dreadfully, uh. co- a dreadfully coy story. I don't think these people have souls. Yeah, no, they, they, <laughs> they like, see, all of them would have been old enough that I think they should have appreciated this a little bit more. Yeah, no, this is actually kind of a turnaround. They're, most of the times, even the, the, the worst critic that comes up with the films that we reviewed, we've all gone, yeah, I see their point, or I can see where they're going for there, but it might have been a little harsh. No, I, I, I can't agree with any of these people. No. <laughs> no, and even while I was either watching Siskel or Ebert or reading these, I'm like, I, I want to see it from your point of view, but I just can't. <laughs> this movie it, it is... Uh, Warm tomato soup and a grilled cheese on a rainy Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's, that's what this is. It's just a... F- mm, I feel good. Uh, I feel better. <laughs> yeah. No, this is the... I've had a bad day. I'm going to watch Heartbeeps. <laughs> yes, I could tell. And I'm going to go to bed with a smile on my yeah, face. Yeah, uh, this is how you turn your day around. <laughs> <laughs> I wish Andy Kaufman were still with us. I want to give him a hug and tell him, no, you did good. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we'll get a chance. Maybe Bernadette Peters is still with us. Bernadette, if you're listening, one, you're still cute as a button. Two, <laughs> come on, uh, <laughs> let, let's talk about heart beeps. Yeah. <laughs> and Stan Winston, yep. of course, I would love to talk to him about it in this. Well, that's just a given. <laughs> We'll talk to you about anything, but yes, we'll. It'll be a hard-hitting uh, interview about heartbeats <laughs> <laughs> and a John Williams score. Yeah, I mean Universal did not skimp on this. No, but see that even that score was just—it was all very airy and light, mm-hmm. and it, it's almost psychedelic in, in its <laughs> in its treatment of this. It's almost too sappy sweet. Well, I would recommend everyone to give Heartbeeps a second chance yes. or or a first or chance a first. if you've never seen this one. Go and seek this one out. I, You know what? I honestly don't think you'll walk away hating it. No. I, 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 I don't think you can. <laughs> I, I, yeah, again, uh, we're, seek therapy if, <laughs> if you struggle with the... If you feel hatred toward this, something somebody hurt you. Get a hug. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, that will do it for this episode. Next time, we're going to go, wow, are we going the opposite direction. <laughs> yes, we are. We're going to check out 2018's Hotel Artemis. This is one that's been on my watch list for a while. You've seen it, you I said. I have, yes. All right, cool. I'm looking forward to it. It's been on my uh, my watch list for a while. I've been wanting to check it out. Uh, it was filmed in 2018, or at least released in 2018. It takes place in 2028, so we will check out and see what the uh, the future holds for us mm-hmm. in the next few years. Might be closer than you think. <laughs> yeah, indeed. Uh, that's going to be a lot of fun. If you've uh, seen Heart Beeps uh, and would like to comment please drop us a line, timeshifterspodcast at gmail.com. If you've seen Hotel Artemis and would like to let us know what you think, same email address. Also, follow the link in the show notes to all the social media and drop us a message there. That's going to do it for this episode. As always, thank you very much for listening. Tom, thank you for joining me. I'm so thrilled that you enjoyed this film too. Too much fun. That's going to do it. Goodbye, everybody. See ya.